evening, everybody, and um, thank you so much for coming. It's really, really uh, nice to be in America, even though, of course, I'm not literally in America. And thank you a lot, Amber. It is a good thing to meet you, and I'm very touched that you have agreed to be part of this. So um, I'm going to read, I'm going to first of all show off how pretty, because so pretty, um, Poppy Show in the States. This um, cover is just the most gorgeous thing. Um, I'm going to read from near the beginning of the book, um, from the point of view of a character called Xavier Red Shoes. And Xavier is a master chef. He's known in this fictional land called Poppy Show as a Macinus. Uh, one in a generation, he's chosen by the gods to cook a single perfect meal for every person in the land. So candidates to become Macinus must go through years of testing. And if you think you might be a Macinus, you have to get at the courage first to ask for that testing. And to do this, Xavier, quite young, must find the Macinus before him, a woman called Desiree, the only woman who's ever held the title. So I'm going to read a tiny bit from him meeting Desiree for the first time. So. Xavier was 16 when he put himself forward for the testing, mostly because he couldn't take the nagging at home anymore. Nothing could have convinced his mother he wasn't Messinas. If Desiree had ended up not saying so, Treya Red Shoes would have burst into her house and told her she was a liar. Better you go ask, said his brother, make her happy. Life with an unhappy mother was not good, they agreed that much. So he went to Desiree's restaurant over on Dukiai and asked in the bakery she ran and went back to the restaurant and asked the staff who teased him. Desiree always have the young boys looking for her. He couldn't believe they were so disrespectful. Everyone knew Desiree de Bernard Mass charmed in all flavors of the rainbow, ripped shark from the ocean that she wore sli slivers of amber sewn in her underwear. He found her on a day he wasn't looking, buying guava cheese and sucking a bag of ice like a street urchin. She was reaching for the same guava cheese as he was, and he was so startled he dropped the suck suck. She eyed him. The cheese seller, recognising the moment, looked as if he might vomit in anxiety for the boy. Xavier cleared his throat. Everyone said the same thing when they applied. That was a mercy. Oh, Macinus, I can sit by you? Desiree put down the guava cheese, picked up a white onion and smelled its root. Hmm, she said, like she might kiss the onion. Oh, gods, said the cheese seller and fanned himself. Xavier hadn't realised a grown woman could be so soft-eyed and succulent, especially this one, who scared grown men. Desiree took a large bite of the onion and chewed calmly. Xavier and the cheese seller grimaced. Desiree looked at Xavier like he was a scavenging thing of the sea. I have all I need, boy. They beat you to it, she said. Xavier turned away, flushed and hot, screaming at himself. Relieved, astonished, it had not occurred to him that he could fail, at least to enter the testing. Everybody said. He didn't believe what everybody said, but at least to try. She called after him. Ask me again. Heart in his throat. What? He deaf too, no? She winked at the hyperventilating guava cheese man. He couldn't, he'd given her all he had, but she was waiting. I can sit by you, he said. Sure, boy, you don't know what you're asking. Cha was an old word. It could be used as a compliment to trivialise, to dismiss, or tenderly coaxing a baby to eat or a man to lie down. She was making fun of him. I can sit by you, Macinus, he said. She crunched the onion and laughed in his face. He turned away again, wanting to piss and to hit something. It's so you give up easy, she said. You're not going to handle my kitchen if you shot a backbone. She was suddenly serious, even angry. Ask me again, boy. And this time, think about how I look good and how you're all sniff sniffing me like puppy dog, reminding me how time passing. Ask again. Make it excellent. He didn't understand. He looked down at the brown freckles in her neckline. 
There were tiny lines at the top of her breasts and he wondered if anyone could see them besides him. I, he said, well, I don't know what you want. She sighed, flapped a hand at him and threw the rest of the onion into a bush. Sit by me, boy, or don't, I don't give a rass. Yes, he said. Yes, she said. He walked away, swelling, then turned back. But you said, she shrugged. I lied. You is the first little doggy to brave it. Oh, I love that. Um, that was such a treat getting to hear you, um, you know, read these, read these words. Um, you know, I'm so excited to be in conversation with you today because um, I just, I read this book and it was actually, it's funny, um, you know, FSG sent this to me and I, I, you know, wasn't sure what to make of it at first. And I was reading it and I was just, which I think is probably a reaction a lot of folks have and to any great book, but, but this one in particular. And I just, started reading and reading and I couldn't put it down and I was just enveloped in this like magical sensual fantastical um really immersive world um so and and you know the dialogue is is so much of that in this book so it was really a treat uh, to get to hear you read that so thank you for that. the right pronunciation of things eh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly well you know I've been in my head I've been saying popisho so now I have to like yes, of course. To yes yes no popisho as in poppy like the, yes <laughs> poppy show. I'm sure in my head I've, I've been saying a lot of things wrong so I need to like I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear this so um so there's a ton of things I want to ask you about this book um and I'm sure folks would, would love to know um you know I think this is this is sort of a, a I know this is not this is a difficult question for any writer to answer about a book, but I would love to hear about your process of writing it um, because you know this feels like one of those books that that could have taken a lifetime for a writer to write um, that you know is is just it's like layered and it's built and and there's so many different characters that are that are so um, you know so vivid. Um, and, and so well realized that I'm just curious, you know, how long did it take and sort of how did you, how did you go about creating Poppy Show and, and all of these characters and how, you know, how was your process? What was that like? Um, I mean, I think I'll start off by saying this, the novel is a beast, yeah? And I don't mean this novel, I mean the novel as a form is a beast. And, you know, maybe you felt this way too when you were a kid and maybe wanting to be a writer. I thought I'd be a novelist. You know, I never wanted to be a poet. I certainly am not that. I never wanted to be a short story writer. I wanted to be a novelist. But the, the novel in reality feels to me personally like, like holding your breath for a very long time. And this took a long time. This was 15 years, I approximate, in the making. It's very difficult sometimes to say when a thing actually begins. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I, I think I, I would like to point out that when I say 15 years in the making, I don't mean I got up every morning and wrote Poppy Show, <laughs> you know, for months at a time, I wouldn't touch it. There were a couple of years when I didn't think about it. Um, you know, I was an academic for all that time. And so I, and I tend to as a writer, I don't know how it is for you, but I'm not one of those writers, you know, those Christian writers who write every day and get up a journal. Like, I'm that person. Um, like I hardly write and I publish everything I write. And when I write, I tend to write in really immersive, intense blocks. So I'd like use summers. Sometimes I got time off, you know, but also I was having a hard time as well with it. Um, not with just it, with writing, with the form, whether I even wanted to be published anymore. I'd published these two novels in my kind of late 20s in rapid succession. And that had left me with a feeling of you know, satisfaction. The books have been, you know, well reviewed generally, but but I wasn't a runaway best-selling writer who could like buy a house. <laughs> and I was very naive. I don't know how this was for you, but I, I think part of me in my 20s thought, I'll write a book and I'll like publish it. And then I'll write another one and everything will be cool, right? And then it, it wasn't. So all of those things coming together. So so that was kind of a backstory and a context for this, this process. And then again, like you and to the audience, I have been fangirling Amber all day and reading her work. It is so astonishing. And I have realized that in a way that you don't know Amber, we are twins. We both, if you still feel this way, as I read in an interview with you, I hate writing. Okay. I love editing. <laughs> Yeah. I love editing. I love fiddling at a sentence and finding the right word. And I know you do too, because your similes are, oh, 
sublime, right? So like, I think we are very similar in this way. And so what I did, because I was feeling so unsure, I created a kind of mountain of words over a period of years. I just free wrote. And so for me and you, the kind of writer who feels uncomfortable with not yet having a thing, a thing you can hold, a shape that you can be sure of. I was just free writing and like crying and free like free writing. But I needed to free write to yeah. get myself back into a space where I, I claimed writing for myself. And so then I had this kind of mountain of about 400 to 500,000 words. And then I began to dig a form out of it. And I think I had the answer, the beginning of an answer, when I realized some very specific constraints. And again, I think it was similar to this. It was form. It was, it's going to be one day with kind of nested flashbacks for context. But it's going to be one day. It's going to be these people. Um, but I think one of the reasons, and we can perhaps talk about this later, is that it's immersive, perhaps, because people tell me that. Perhaps one of the reasons is because I got to know it so very well because I wasn't setting limits on myself. I was just writing everything about its flora, its fauna. You know, that cheese seller I just talked about who's freaked out when Desiree and Xavier meet each other. I know his wife, I know his divorce, I know, you know, and he's never mentioned again. <laughs> but it was that kind of process. Yeah. I can see that. I you could I mean when you read the book, I I, I feel like you you can see that. I can like see his his wife um you know they, they did the characters just come to life so much that way and that's and I, I think that's uh encouraging to me to hear in a way that it took 15 years because you know we always hear these stories of novels that get you know written in like a month or whatever and 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 it feels and you know some great novels have been written that way but 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 it also feels to me sometimes like um the the novels where these characters really uh, come to life um, and and feel this world feels lived in. Um, I think oftentimes those books do take longer because um, the, the I think the writer really has to sit with them, right? Oh, I love your kitty. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I have a kitty right next to me that's almost the exact same colors, which is funny. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, she so so I think. I, I love that. And I think, um, you know, that's also encouraging to me because I've been writing a novel for like five years now and, um, and you know, sitting with these characters for, for all that time. And, and I totally, I feel that because I'm the same way. I, like you said, I'm, I, I, and I write in bursts too, by the way. I do not, I write every day. I cannot do that. I've never done that. It's definitely very like immersive and obsessive, like bursts of writing. Oh um, God, we are <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I think we are twins. Um, and and it's uh, and and it, you're right. It's like it's really you know when you have a short story, it's it's or an essay or something like that. It's like okay, I've done the work, I've got the form, and now I can edit it. And that is you know. Yeah, you hit that sweet spot quicker, of course, yeah, because yeah. because the thing I didn't say is that in this 15 year period, I was writing and publishing short stories, and you know like they were yeah. the, the love of my life. Lots of people are quite into saying, you know, the short story is this challenging form. And of course it's a, it's a challenging form and should be greatly respected. But for me, it was like a swig of vodka, man. Like I could get there fast. I could conceive of something. I could put something down. I could make some decisions about form and structure and where it was going. I could write it. I could get that hit that comes with, oh, now I've got it. I could fiddle it and then it would be done. And I could do that in a day. You know, I could do that in three hours on a good day. Yeah. and get the hit that we get and get to the point that I think we both love which is the fiddling with the sentences and the making beautiful and the, the getting precise and the cleaning away the you know the dust and all of that kind of stuff or using the dust if we, we need to use it you know yeah. um so short stories I I love and I'm I'm a better short story writer because I've done it more you know um to, then I'm still learning how to be a novelist. And I really want to, you know, it sounds, I don't mean it to sound condescending in any way, but I'm telling you, girl, you're going to finish that novel. Don't, <laughs> let's, let's not, let's just free ourselves from this idea that we have to slam out that novel every two years. I mean, I don't think I'll ever take 15 years again. I think yeah. this one needed that somehow. And I have started this process of promoting it at the very beginning, feeling embarrassed, feeling ashamed. People are gonna ask me, why did it take so long? And sometimes, you know, I wrote throughout my thirties, my forties and into my fifties, this novel. 
And, you know, there were people around me who absolutely, the majority of my, my crew believed in this and supported me and knew I could do it. But occasionally someone would say, sure, you're not done yet. And I'm like, no, wait, <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait. So I think you will know, Amber, you yeah. will know when you're done. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I think that's exactly right. I want to so, read and that, and you know, it gives me it gives me a lot of um, you know confidence to know that that's there. There is a space for that kind of writing too, because sometimes I think we forget about that a lot of times. That there's this, and our whole society is all about churning things out as quickly as possible, and so you know, that's definitely good to know. Yeah, um, you should be okay with that. Exactly. Um, so I'm curious, you know, when you were writing Papa Show, um, you know. This obvi obviously, it's you know very influenced by your own background, um, I, by living in Jamaica. Um, do you want to? Can you talk a little bit about like sort of the pro? You know, I was thinking about as I was writing this, these writers that create these great like fictional worlds that are that are sort of you know loosely modeled on 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 worlds that they know very well, right? I'm thinking like you know Faulkner or Morrison or. Um, you know, Rian Amilcar Scott, I don't know if you're familiar with his Cross River stuff, um, yeah. you know, um, but I'm, but I'm thinking like, is that, is that something that you, I, I assume, and maybe I shouldn't assume, but is, is that, did, you know, your sort of life in Jamaica affect and, and shape this work in a dramatic way for you? I think the answer is both yes and no. Um, there is certainly a level to this work that is absolutely only for Jamaicans and Caribbean people. There are in-jokes, refer even, even the, 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 let's start with the title. The etymology of poppy show means a kind of a foolishness to make a fool of. A man can be made a poppy show of if he is, for example, cheated on by his wife, if he's cuckolded. But poppy show is also one of those kinds of mischievous, almost, <laughs> one of those words that takes on so much cultural re resonance that nobody but Jamaicans understand why Jamaicans are now looking at this book and going, she called it Bobby Show and bursting into laughter, right? And so there are this, there is this level of, particularly within the use of language and a lot of the cultural references that are, there are a, a deliberate gift for my peeps. They're like, this is for you. And uh, what, that shouldn't be misunderstood. There's plenty to understand for everybody else. And of course, allies and those who know us will also recognize some of the references. But so that so there's that, first of all. Um, I didn't want to, I, I think I also hasten to say this is not Jamaica. I mean, obviously not. Jamaica does not have literal magic in it. Or if it does, I want to know about it. But um, it's, it's not actually Jamaica, but it's very Jamaican-like and it's very Caribbean-esque, but it also picks up other levels. I have traveled throughout the Caribbean, at least partially, certainly in my childhood, adolescence, my early 20s. So there are kind of Francophone Patois influences as well. Um, I was saying the other night at my launch uh, in London that um, I really want to uh, play around with the sounds of the Caribbean, all of the sounds of the Caribbean that I can remember. Um, however, I think perhaps an important point here is that Poppy Show is a land that while in some ways it may be very Caribbean, what it has that's very particular about it besides the magic is that it's never been colonized. And it's a kind of, I hope, quite subtle influence in the book, but several of the characters will say over and over, we have never been slaves here. And it is something that they are very proud of, but they're also really aware and makes it different in the ways that their, their, their community has become what it's become. Um, so so in, in that, I also decided that there were things about the Caribbean, there were issues that are complex to us, things like our relationship to crime, for example, our relationship to tourism and being consumed that all of these things I would push away and leave out and ask, what can we be without those things? But but I think I, you know, when you look at things in retrospect, they kind of become quite heavy on the book and expectations. I hold these ideas quite lightly. I think they they occurred to me instinctually rather than specifically, rather than heavily and going, I will now write a post-colonial world that was never colonized. <laughs> it's not so heavy, you know, but it came as a result of trusting my instincts, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, you don't have like A is B and B is C. No. It just stands for the it's really yeah. hard to describe that, right? Like, don't you freak yeah. out when people say to you, where do you get your ideas from? It's like, I don't, the, the, I swear the, the most 
<laughs> honest answer any author can have to any version of that question is I don't know yeah or everywhere <laughs> everywhere In everything who knows yeah, yeah. yeah. who yeah. knows yeah yeah. <laughs> it's all but, but I understand the question I don't want to be like you know dismissive of the question I really yeah. get the question and I think people are saying to us in a way what it means is what are you doing what, explain to us quantify for us begin an explanation of your thing that you're doing in front of us and I don't think it's always helpful for the writer to to nail that down yeah. you know yeah no I think that's right I think it's when I when I teach um, you know, writing, I think one of the, one of the things I end up teaching a lot is, is, um, sort of variation of where do you get your ideas, which is, you know, how generating ideas, right? Like generating, um, and, and honestly, I feel like most of that is just teaching your brain how to work in a different way, like teaching you to just be, be thinking and influenced by all of these different things that you read and see and experience. And I call it making yourself porous. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. Just like open to everything. And then of course, anything can, yes. you know, a moment with a bird, a, 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 a conversation, a little bit of conversation you hear passing down the road, or anything can become interesting and magical in the start of something else. And it really is about going, oh, how wonderful is the world? And how can I grab those, you, you know, those resources? And how can I let them in? And how can I not start having an argument with myself about there's something wrong with that? Or that's the wrong idea. Or I can't do that. You know, our judge self comes crashing in quite quickly, but, but it's to kind of push that away again. Yeah. yeah. In many ways, I think teaching the subject is about teaching or enabling creatives to think like writers. I think that's right. Absolutely. Think like writers. Yeah. So, so I wanted to ask you about um, food <laughs> and obviously food, I mean, even just in this section that you read, but I mean, literally, I mean, the, of course, obviously the, the subject of the book if it is, is food as much as it is anything, um, you know, and, and our main character is, is, you know, his, that's his whole sort of role is to provide these like magical feasts for, you know, every, every person in Poppy Show um, once in a lifetime. And so, uh, but, but I mean, I think, you know, food is like tied with its magic, it's tied with sex, it's tied with humor, it's tied with shame. It's like, like, there's literally nothing I feel like in the novel that is not intimately connected to back to food, which is something I really love as I was reading this, you know, I'm, a, I like to eat <laughs> and I love food. So, so, you know, and, and I, and I read, you know, I was thinking about like, a lot of the Chinese authors that I've actually read, like Mo Yan, um, and 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 how big um, food is in the culture, and how much it's present in everything, including like sex and magic and all these uh, different things. And and I was just thinking about how barren a lot of the um, you know Western literature that I read actually is. It's like um, you do to stop to eat, right? Yeah, so. the, no, <laughs> it's about food, even though it's something that we're like constantly thinking of and doing and, and, and most of us enjoy very much. Um, so yeah, I don't know, you know, this isn't really a specific question, but I don't know if you can kind of talk about, did you set out to like, to write about food or is that just something that kind of ended up, you know, being the, the soul of the book? I mean, I think at, at the beginning, I, what I wanted to look at was fame actually, and uh, what it is to be looked at by lots of people and what it is for your motivations and your experiences in life to be covered with other people's assumptions. And so for a long time, Xavier was a photographer, but I was determined for the first two novels, I'd done such a lot of research. I did not want to do lots of research for this third novel. And so I was like, I don't know enough about photography and I can't be bothered to go look it up, but I can cook. And I'm not a bad cook. I mean, I'm okay. You know, I'm one of those cooks that I can do like six things and really well. <laughs> and, um, and, but then I paused because I actually don't like food. And what I mean by that is I have decades of an eating disorder. And so my experiences with food are complex and painful and, and not nearly as kind of seamless as the people who love the food. And so I kind of paused. I thought, well, that, that's challenging. I thought, let me intellectualize it. And so in some ways, and by intellectualize, I mean, of course, find the right language for it, no? So how do I 
talk about food from the point of view of a chef because chefs are crazy. Chefs are like us. They are intense and immersive and work too hard and nobody understands them and they're deeply irresponsible. And yet they're, <laughs> they kind of have this astonishing commitment to nourishment and, and the move of the seasons and their hands. They're very, you know, visual and they're very sensual and they're, 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 they're difficult as well. And I began to relate to that, the people who make the food, the master chefs of the world. I was reading a lot. The only research I really did was reading a lot about chefs, watching a lot of TV shows, watching the way that chefs move, chefs saying to each other, you know, you move like a chef. I'm like, what are they talking about? You know? So I got kind of interested in and obsessed with, with chefdom and the psychology of chefs, which then allowed me to, to take on some of their concerns about nourishment and creativity and specificity and detail and so then I thought right I let me write about food trying to make it beautiful let me do some healing for myself and I was also in therapy as well and beginning to look at food in different ways and so on and so I think that's where it came from it's a combination it's an intellectual exercise it's one in which I was interested in a certain psychology but also was doing some healing myself um, I'm really I will say this I'm, I'm proud of this I'm proud that I keep getting asked about the food. And of course you all are asking about the food. And every time you go, I'm going now. And then I go, no, nope, you can talk about the food. The challenge was to find different ways to make food beautiful, accessible, interesting, magical, multi-layered. And actually it's a gift, no? Because of course, smell, texture, taste, yeah. That's, that's really, that's fascinating. And I, I think, I mean, that's actually really beautiful and moving that you were, that you were able to kind of use, use this novel to, to help heal yourself. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it comes across, I think, in the novel in an interesting way, some that complexity that, yeah. that, you know, food is, is many, many things and is attached to many emotions and in many, many different sort of like scenarios. And that's really, that that like makes more sense to me now actually in, in a way so. don't you think I think this is something that's occurred to me over the years I think I don't you know I don't think we have to get too dramatic about it writing a novel does not have to kind of wrench your soul into many pieces but if it teaches you something along the way especially if it's been a long ass novel then I think that's fine and so, so I was, I was pleased for that. I was pleased that I came out the other end, believe me, not healed, <laughs> right? Because right. I think we sit with disordered eating and, and many other, you know, experiences for, for our lives. And that's just that complexity is. And niece in the book says, there are some things that are just sad. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I would not want anyone, especially people with disordered eating issues to think that I wrote a book and then I heal myself and everything's cool. Not, not at all, right? But I was, I was also happy to do something frightening for myself somehow that gives the book the edge you know that that's I think that's there's something to be said for that just as a wordsmith it's like frighten yourself to shift yourself move yourself take a chance um and so that was mine everything else is easy the sex was easy the politics was easy yeah I don't have a problem with that even the race was easy post-colonial issues I can do all of that but food yeah. mm. that's interesting that's I that's really fascinating so I think you know speaking I guess since you mentioned sex <laughs> I I would love to ask about the, the so so you know there are I mean this is this this book you know for those of you who haven't read it is is so like body and it's great it's just it's like and there's so much sex that it's like all these different things there's like good sex and bad sex and you know, sort of wrote sex, and um, and um, it's just it's it's as full of that as it is is food, and often the two you know are very much sort of intermingled, um, which I, I I love, and there's just this like sensuality to all of it. Um, I think you know, but it was interesting too how that's sort of those issues of of love and sex and also addiction, um, you know, this are sort of interwoven together throughout the novel in this in this really interesting and sometimes very unexpected way. I mean, you know, um, the, the main character has an addiction to, you know, his addiction is to moths, mm -hmm. uh, to eating moths. So, <laughs> you know, um, which is, you know, of course, this sort of symbolic thing as well. But, um, but yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about you said, so you said, 
the sex was not hard <laughs> for you. That was that was not hard for you to write. Did you always know that you would have sort of this novel that's full of like just full of all of these big things, of these sort of wrestling with these big issues and these big things, concepts? I don't know that I knew that. I mean, I actually and don't laugh at me, um, but even though you you might having read the novel, I don't think of this as a very sexual novel at all. It's like there's not very much sex in it. And then I'm reminded of something my grandmother said to me many years ago. Maybe I was on novel two at that point. She never read novel three. Um, I said, people are kind of like talking to me about, I keep writing about sex and it's kind of annoying me because it's no big deal. And I, I you know, it, she said, ah, I think it's because you kind of absentmindedly see texture and sensuality and, and sexual energy all over the place. So you kind of just include it without thinking about it. For ages, Amber, I kept saying to people, there's only one sex scene in this book. And then someone wrote, oh, don't be ridiculous, there is not one sex scene in this book. And I was like, oh yeah, there are more, oh yes, there are more, right? And it, I swear it's a kind of absent-mindedness. It's like, it's such a, I think writing about sexuality and expressing sexuality is such a powerful, important, gorgeous, necessary metaphor for everything that I don't understand why people don't write more sex because it tells us so much about who we are if we're concerned with characterization if we're concerned with you know plot structure if we're concerned with tension with the complexity of humanity sex right why not and, and in all of its different flavors I think I more thought about it as flavors of love oddly than sex you know friendship and obsession and true love and the love that got away and that comes back to you again and so I think I think of it more in terms of love and emotions but I'm not disagreeing with you I'm just saying absent-mindedly I kind of didn't notice <laughs> no I think that's well you know again to, to go back to this, this there's sort of this I mean oh lord my you know my my like inheritance is this very like sort of Swedish Protestant like <laughs> uh, thing. So, so, you know, you don't even like talk about sex, let alone, you know, like write about it in a book, God forbid. Um, By the way, that's the of the Caribbean too. People have ideas about the Caribbean. Oh my God, exotic, sensual, blah, blah. No, many of the same issues. Yeah. Really very, so many yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's a weird thing. Like, you know, I remember the first the first time, you know, and my God, I'm in my forties, but I, you know, I still think about like my parents, my, you know, reading, reading something or my family reading something and get a little like, oh, I don't know. But, and it's like, oh my God, what this is like, you're writing about life. You're a 40 something year old woman. You're allowed to write. But it is complicated. I mean, the other day I was yeah. reading a particular scene in which um, uh, it's what won't particularly give anything away. At one point, all the women, their vulvas fall away from their bodies. And uh, one of our primary characters is holding her vulva in her hand and looking at it. And I was reading that section out loud for somebody on a podcast or something. And I kept kind of bucking at the word clitoris. Not because I have a problem with the word clitoris, but because I was aware other people may have a problem with the word clitoris. Yes. And so I felt self-conscious because I was like, oh God, all of the clitoris, you know, uh, whisperers in the room. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know what I mean? All of the people unsure about the word or the idea are going to, because because we're, we're not only careful about sexuality on the page, also women's desire is a complex thing to put on the page to claim to then watch people consume. Um, I was lucky because I had a really excellent sex education. Um, my parents were young and um, uh, lefties and um, artists and uh, I, certainly they had their own self-consciousness but were quite determined to give their little girl a kind of robust uh, reference points for both what the physicality actually was like what is sex and how does it work yeah. and how do periods work and so on but also they wanted to talk to me about how it was a pleasurable thing and a good thing I shouldn't feel ashamed I also had a stepfather who kind of stepped in at a point stepmother as well um, who who had their own contributions to make my stepfather was invaluable talking to me about boys about the fact that no boy is going to die if you don't sleep with him do not believe him and like all of this kind of composite of adults being sex positive has made a profound difference in my life. Yeah, there's, it's, it's good. That, it's interesting that you mentioned, so that scene with the women and their vulvas falling, falling off is like one of my favorite scenes in the book. It's so, it's so like unexpected and funny um, and great. And their reactions, I won't give anything away, but their reactions to what happens are, are just priceless as well. Um, and uh, and I, I was just, that reminded me, you know, uh, there are so many interesting women in this book. 
um, and the way that um, what a weak state, more than interesting, but but they you know the way that they are written and the way that they are so complex and that they you know wrestle with power and with sexuality and with the idea of of you know being wanted or beauty or um, you know what you use sex for. Um, you know, one character is afraid to, to to have sex. You know, with her with her soon to be husband. Like, you know. So so, I thought. Um, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to to sort of to that because I I really, I guess what I'm saying is I really I I found the portrayal um, of women to be really brilliantly complex in this novel. There wasn't sort of this sense of like all these women are empowered and it's great. It was like, it was much more complex than that. And, and I don't know if you want to speak to kind of how you got to that point or if that was something you always wanted to do with this book or. I think the trope of the powerful woman is ultimately really damaging or potentially damaging. Um, the trope of the strong woman who sorts it all out, who walks through life with, you know, a strut, particularly where that is relevant also to women of color or working class women, it, I think, becomes a noose around our necks. Because then when are we allowed to cry? And when are we allowed to, um, I don't know, like a man calling to us on the street and saying, queen, you look pretty. And when are we allowed to be this nuanced, complex, um, flawed, gorgeousness that we are and I don't think the answer is to create strong one-dimensional woman apart from anything else writer to writer to me that's bad characterization and just strong yeah. and powerful just like what one-dimensional foolishness is that right. right so yes a concern for all kinds of different women in here Anise our kind of primary female protagonist is um is concerned with, with 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 she's doing the pretending and being strong because she's had four miscarriages and she's yeah. walking on the world pretending that she's okay. She is not okay, and her redemption comes from crying. Her redemption comes from looking to her girlfriends and going, "I am weak and I am sad and I don't know whether I can ever get better." And that's where she starts being strong. Other women, you know, I, I mean, we could talk for ages and I'm aware of the time, but other women are positioned in this society in order to both wield power, but also to make peace with their, their needs, their desires, the things that make them ashamed. There's a beauty contest, like I hope no other beauty contest ever in the world, in which, yes, women are allowed to and encouraged to strut and show the variety of their gorgeous bodies and the different shades of their skin and their fat and their thinness and their tall and their short, but also their debating as well. It's a debate competition and so on. And I know that there are people who have reservations about about that. Um, certainly I'm a womanist, a feminist, and there are certain feminists who say to me, well, you know, this emphasis on the body and beauty and whatever. Yeah, well, you know, it's nice to strut. It's nice to strut. And I don't think that my sexuality or my experience of my body have anything to do with the male gaze. They can belong only to me. And I think we should be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I hope it's a book full of those kinds of ideas. Yeah, I think that's exactly, I love, I love that. And I think it's, it's, you know, it's very, like, it's very powerful that celebrating all these different kinds of bodies and, and celebrating being in these bodies and, and that they are all beautiful. So I think that's, um, I think, I think that's something I found just really refreshing about the book is that there's, there is so much sort of celebration of this stuff that, um, it's very about beautiful. women that, that is, it's, it's beautiful very... and it's, it's joyful, I think, to read. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, that was very deliberate. If if there were lots of things that were unconscious and just came out as they did instinctively over the years, that one I was like, because uh, I realized my two first books, I've been writing about all of these socially acceptably beautiful women. I thought, what are you doing? You're a fat woman. What are you doing? And I suddenly thought, no, I have to show that myself again, that I've grown in this way. There are going to be a variety of bodies in this book. It's going to look like real women. That was really important. So I am being told we should get some questions here and we have some good <laughs> questions in the audience. So um, uh, let's see. So is it Aisha? I'm probably saying your name wrong. I really apologize for that. Um, but Aisha say, says, I'm fascinated by the cuff the women wear. All of the women wear them in Papa Show. And what about the moth? How did you land on that as a drug? Is that what you intended? 
Okay, really quickly. Um, the cuffs come from a kind of, you know, wedding cuffs that you wear. Um, oh, what are they called? Amber, help me with this. Are you a girly girl? Um, did you wear one for your wedding? You know, they kind of goes around yeah. your thigh and, you know. Oh, the garters? Like garters. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yes. <laughs> I kind of played around with that. I like the idea of garters. And then I, I thought it, I wanted to exaggerate it. So all the women in Poppy Show kind of have garters. I, I call them cuffs around their right thighs. And there's this kind of, whole intricate thing of them kind of bringing their skirts up and showing their cuff to the men or women that they like. Um, it's harder to be a lesbian in this society, it is homophobic. Um, but, but there's a kind of whole ritual of flirtation. A woman only shows you her cuff one time and then you're gonna have to act on it. She's not gonna do it again. But I liked that idea that um, open flirtation and a kind of joyful feeling around that, Aisha. So that's why I had the cuffs. Um, uh, let's see, moth. I like moths. I'm very fond of them. Um, in Jamaica, there is a superstition among some people that we have quite big moths and they kind of arrive and people say that they're the, somebody died and it's the, the spirit of, of, of come through. So people are a bit funny about moths. And I have a tendency to be on the side of the underdog. So, and moths are beautiful, but they're not kind of, you know, celebrated as much as butterflies are and so in that kind of way I wanted to give the moth a chance. In this society moths are like heroin, they're badass, they will kill you dead. Butterflies a bit like liquor. So yes, I, and, and then I, I, I know now a ridiculous amount about moths and butterflies and the differences between them that I won't bore you with, but, but yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and then Ramya says, you talked about how writing is difficult and I really relate with the sense of anxiety that can permeate the writing process or the idea of publishing. Um, well, that's, and that's a whole another anxiety. Uh, do you have any tips for the days when the words won't come and nothing has shape and the novel is beating you? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I would, uh, uh, this I know has changed my experience of writing. Somewhere throughout maybe the ha halfway mark on this novel, I began to get really irritated with my own judgment voice. It just kept screaming at me, you're not any good, you're not any good, you're all right. And I, I, one day I literally turned around and yelled back at it, what do you want? What do you want? And then began a kind of almost visualizing process of like imagining the judge in front of me. I said, seriously, what is the problem? And almost immediately my judge went, I just, I just, I just want you to, to be good. And I realized my judge is terrified. And that's why it's so aggressive and yelling at me and telling me that I'm not any good. And I sat down and had a conversation with it. And I did quite a lot of journaling around it as well. And perhaps this is something that, that you can think about doing. What is the purpose of your judge? I began to actually appreciate that not only was my judge self quite frightened, but also he or she or it were of use to me because my judge is also my editor. What the judge wants to do is jump in and fix things and make them right and get sure, you know, hurry up. Don't, don't, you know, like we were saying earlier, don't spend lots of time writing this imperfect crap, you know, get to the editing parts. So you can make it perfect. I'm like, wow, you're controlling and you're terrified. So I thought, right, have a conversation with this judge. When I began to realize that he or she or it could be of use to me, I then negotiated with it. I said, right, you can come and edit the stuff tomorrow at three o'clock but right now I have to write some stuff if I don't write the stuff you're not going to have anything to edit or make perfect so can we make a, a you know can we decide together that you will return when you're of most use to me and then you can gallop through and you can fix things and you can make yourself feel safe and now that actually works very well for me so I would say this sit down perhaps and have a, a word with look at explore the part of you that is frightened and tired, that is judgmental and develop a relationship with it because actually you need a working relationship with it. Now, when my judge, doesn't mean my judge doesn't jump up. My judge jumps up, uh, you know, frequently. I don't know again, if this is true for you too, Amber, you know, again, that's not right. That's not proper. And I just go, oh, hi. Yes, inevitable. There you are again, feeling frightened. <laughs> right. Let's do two o'clock this afternoon. You can come. <laughs> Works like a charm now, but that took a long time. I, I love that too, because um, for those of you in the audience, you just got like a little tiny masterclass in, in <laughs> also. 
in visual. That was so good. It was like a little story just <laughs> developed out of out of a writing lesson. That was amazing. Um, I, I now have like a, there's like a judge character that I you know I feel like I know well. Um, that's that's also a great answer though. I think I think that's exactly right. I think it's it's there's nobody like you know even like my agent will say this to me like you're not like I'm not I don't I'm not waiting for your stuff like I don't care. It, I mean I care but I'm you know that's you, the only person that's like sitting here you know na nagging at me is me um, it's, 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 from freaking out is my judge. Yeah. I think that's right. Um, so, uh, Emily says, uh, you know, as a student, I've been told stick to what you know best. Do you agree with that? Or do you think it's okay to broaden your horizons when you're writing? Um, this might indeed be Emily who used to be my student, which is very funny. Um, uh, if it is, hello, Emily. If it's not, hello, Emily. Um, okay. I suppose, I think we have to be careful here. Because lots of people, lots of writers like saying, no, you know, ignore the, uh, the, the, the principle that says, write what you know, you know, strike out, you should have permission, you can do anything. The problem with writing anything, almost as a kind of stubborn revolution, rebellion, is that then you don't know what you're writing about. And so what comes out is risks being cliched, risks being an assumption, risks not being what makes writing good, which is being specific and detailed. So I, you know, far for me to tell anybody what they should write about. If you want to write about something that you know nothing about, and that's what turns you on, absolutely, Emily, do it. But be warned, if you don't know about it, the writing will not sing, because all good writing is really specific. And that's all. So if you want to write about something you don't know very much about, then go find out about it, is the other answer. I didn't know very much about moths and butterflies. Now I could write a whole book on moths and butterflies, which is why I can write about them relatively convincingly. If I just decided I write about moths and butterflies because I want to, because I'm an artist, that would have been fine. But I would have missed a trick because I don't know anything about moths and butterflies when I started. But that's, that's my very teachery response. Do what you like would be the primary. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I think, and I, I really like, you know, I think about that a lot in terms also of like sort of uh, like regions um, and, and very specific locations too. I, you know, I know at one point when I was writing The Unfinished World, which, which actually started out as a novel, is now a novella, but, um, you know, I wanted to set the whole thing in, uh, the UK, um, because I, you know, so I sort of, I grew up reading, I had a, a Scottish aunt who sent me all these books, and I grew up reading about the UK, reading about, you know, stuff that took place in Ireland, and children that lived in London, and all this stuff, so I kind of, I had this stupid idea that, like, oh, I know what that's like, right, you as, the, you know, Londoner can laugh at me, but, so I was, so, you know, and I, of course, I grew up in the Midwest, and knew absolutely nothing about what it's actually like to live there, um, and so, you know, I started writing this thing and, and, you know, my first readers were like, I don't think, you, in, including a friend of mine who actually lives in Scotland was like, you don't want to do that. Like, you know, you <laughs> trust me when I tell you that you don't want to set a novel in a place that you don't know, like, you know, intimately. Um, and, and so, you know, I ended up eventually, I think what, one of the characters is, it lives briefly in Ireland and that I spent a lot of time researching the very specific part of Ireland and the very specific era that she lives in. Mm -hmm. But like, for the most part, you know, it doesn't take place there. It takes place in Los Angeles and all over the place. So, and I think that was, um, you know, I, so I think, but, but the, but, you know, to your point, like you can sort of write about all, anything. And, and especially different topics and different different do it if you want do it if yeah. you want but you know when we point and laugh at you yeah take the pointing and laughing that's <laughs> like all. if, if and you I had written want, about <laughs> i don't want that to happen to me you know what i mean like i want to write a book that's good and that the scottish people or the irish people or the cats yes. or moths or whatever go yeah you got that right right or the so, chefs right yeah. if you had written a book and never yes the chef food yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i yeah. check with the chef <laughs> 